So our first speaker this afternoon is Dr. Muning. He's an associate professor, uh, Department of Health Policy and Management at Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health. Uh, Dr. Muning studies the way in which social policies on education, immigration, welfare, control of industrial pollution, health insurance, and the built environment can be optimized to maximize population well-being. He does so using randomized policy experiments coupled with cost-effectiveness analysis. His current research investigates whether social policies implemented by New York City explain that city's dramatic increase in life expectancy over the past decade. He has worked with government agencies on immigration policy in Canada and the US, health insurance reform in China, and the design of a healthy city in China. In the future, he hopes to study the health, developmental, economic, and environmental effects of healthy communities in China. In that particular city, 1.2 million low to middle income residents will be randomly assigned to remain in their current housing or to move into high quality housing embedded within car free green space that includes exercise facilities and access to the city's monorail transit system. He, he hypothesizes sorry, that a move to healthy communities will alter children's gene function, biochemical processes, cognitive potential, body mass index, mood, injury rates, and ultimately their ability to thrive as adults and elderly people. Sounds great. <laughs> <clears throat> Our second speaker of the afternoon session will be Vishan Chakrabarty. Uh, Vishan is the Mark Holliday Professor of Real Estate Development and Director, Center for Urban Real Estate, uh, Columbia University Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation. He is also a partner at Shop Architects. Uh, Professor Chakrabarty is the author of a recently published book, A Country of Cities, A Manifesto for an Urban America, published through Metropolis DAP Books in 2013. In 2004 to 2009, Professor Chakrabarty was an executive vice president at the Related Companies where he ran the Moynihan Station project and oversaw planning and design for the firm's extensive development portfolio, including Hudson Yards. Prior, his, prior to his work at Related, uh, he served as a director of the Manhattan office for the New York Department of City Planning. And prior to this, he was an associate partner and director of urban design at Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill as well as a transportation planner at the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. He serves on the boards of the Architectural League of New York and Enterprise Community Partners, is a trustee of the Citizens Budget Commission, as, and is an emer emeritus board member of Friends of the High Line. Metropolis Magazine named him one of the top 12 game changers for 2012. Professor Chakrabarty is a David Rockefeller Fellow and was a Crane's 40 Under 40 in 2000. And our last speaker for the afternoon session is Natalie German Jenko, uh, Associate Professor of Art, New York University Steinhardt School of Culture, Education, and Human Development. Awarded the 2013 Most Innovative People Award, named of the most influential women in technology in 2011, one of the inaugural top young innovators by MIT Technology Review, and 40 most influential designers, Ms. German Jenko directs the Environmental Health Clinic and is an associate professor in the Visual Arts Department, NYU, and affiliated with the Computer Science Department and Environmental Studies Program. Previously, she was on the Visual Arts faculty at US, sorry, UCSD, Faculty of Engineering at Yale University, a visiting professor at Royal College of Art in London, a distinguished visiting professor in the Public Understanding of Science at Michigan State University, and a visiting global distinguished professor at the NYU College of Arts and Sciences. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Munig as a first speaker this afternoon. Hey, thanks so much. Um, that sounded a lot fancier than it was. I actually didn't get that in a H grant or where in review and resubmission anyway. So <laughs> sounds fancy anyway. So when I was thinking about what I was going to talk about today, uh, I sort of looked at the lineup and I was like, oh my god, like how do you actually build on what is self-evident that everybody's going to talk about, you know, in the morning, it's going to be amazing, and uh, all I can do is sort of summarize and reiterate. I mean, there's like great, uh, great thinkers in this area that came up before me. Um, so the question that I sort of grappled with was like, well, how do you actually meet that standard? And um, if you can't meet the standard, the answer is to sort of like challenge everything, right? Hey, <laughs> so that's what I decided to do. So I wanted to, 
I wanted to, um, to take a, a little bit more of a critical viewpoint towards um, a lot of the things that were talked at this morning, about this morning. So don't feel like I'm attacking you personally if I call out like, an individual example or, or anything like that. Um, I really wanted to, um, to sort of step back from everything we're doing and to try and think a little bit more critically about uh, where we need to go as we move forward. Okay, so um, I guess uh, one thing uh, that sort of happened to me when I was uh, asked to come on to as a consultant to a the design of a new healthy city within China. China, as you probably all know, has tons of cities being built, and a lot of these cities are sort of being built uh, in a free market kind of way, and other cities are being built in a very planned way. And uh, the guy, this one city that's being built in a planned way is like focused on you know, environmental uh, uh, disasters, you know, prevention of those, um, dealing with uh, the health of the people that live there, all these other things. And so I was brought on to be one of the health people and he said to me, the guy who's leading the health team said to me, like, uh, okay, well, we're going to fire two of the feng shui people <laughs> and bring you on because, you know, this is, we need this to be scientifically and policy based. And I said, okay, well, the first thing I'm going to do as your consultant is tell you to fire me and rehire those two feng shui people <laughs> because they know what's going on socioculturally and they're the ones that are going to be able to say, like, oh, well, we need waterways with weeping willows and bamboo and like all these other things and it's going to be like a great place aesthetically and you're going to get a lot further uh, with health than you would with me summarizing um, what little we know in the scientific literature. So let's take a look at this really quickly. Um, <laughs> feng shui, right? Um, so, you know, basically uh, I, I think what we've heard this morning is that we have we have a problem, right? And um, to sort of contextualize that and summarize it a little bit, one way of looking at this problem is that it was created by the market and policymakers, right? So how did the market create these problems? Well, um, you know, tire companies and automobile companies and oil companies basically brought, bought out our public transportation systems, took out the tracks, put in roads, right? And then policy, that created some a demand for cars, it worked. They did their job. That's exactly what they're supposed to do. That's what they're incentivized to do. That was their job. They did it, they did it well. Uh, what did policymakers do? They looked at this problem that was being created by these market forces. They said, oh, there's lots of cars on the road. There's congestion. Uh, let's build more roads. That will reduce the congestion, right? So this is a classic problem in urban planning, right? You build more roads. It actually creates more of a market for cars, uh, reduces the cost of owning an, uh, an automobile, increases oil exploration, uh, and incentivizes people to move where property is cheaper further and further away from cities, and then you get this urban sprawl and exurbanization, right? Okay, so you've all heard this story before, but the key point here is that this is a market and policymaker pr created problem, right? And that, in turn, created a big problem, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> the big problem we've heard about this morning as well, which is that you know, we're faced with skyrocketing rates of obesity and, uh, uh, and you know, these autom the move towards automobiles uh, is creating uh, increasing heart disease both through reduced exercise but also through inhaling air pollutants and create creating uh, PM 2.5 in our atmosphere, which is creating lung cancer and COPD uh, and stroke. So we've, we've heard these stories, right? And um, probably for those of you who have, nobody in New York has kids, right? But for those of few of you in the audience who do have kids, um, probably within your kids' generation, this very room could well be underwater, right? By the time they reach the end of their lifespan. Um, that's dramatic, you know? That New York is a beautiful place and it's, you know, supposed to be underwater at some point if you believe uh, the climate change models. Okay. So um, really, the challenge then is to figure out, well, we have these forces. Like, the market's not going away. The market is, and it's bringing us great things, you know? Like, they want to have this microphone, the computer, the PowerPoint. The market is bringing us great things. The question is, how do we think, as researchers, how do we shepherd policymakers to shepherd the market in a way that doesn't keep the market from doing it, what it does? Like, we want Ford to do what it does. We want Apple to do what it does. How do we think about um, shepherding these processes in ways that improve health, right? So that's the big picture. And a lot of what we do 
um, as, as researchers is we think about the little things, right? <laughs> We're really focused on one specific aspect of a problem and trying to understand it. Now, another issue that we have, right, is that our entire academic system is set up so that we basically, um, we basically incentivize to look at a lot of correlations, right? If you don't, it's publish or perish. If you don't get articles out there, you don't get tenure, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, we look at correlational data. That's one of the things we do, and we try and look at it in innovative ways. We try and answer, raise innovative research questions, but, uh, you know, most junior faculty don't have the time to, you know, put in an NIH grant for an experiment that's going to randomly assign uh, develop, like an, an Andrew is working and, and his team is working with uh, developers, which is amazing and innovative, but how do we actually think about, well, can we randomly assign developers to think about health or not to think about health, you know, and, <laughs> you know, like, how do we, how do we take the next step in, in, in sort of term, determining causality? See that we wanted to do that and we're a junior faculty, um, we wouldn't be able to do that, right? Because by the time you get you know, your NIH grant and you finish the experiment, your tenure clock is already up and you haven't published anything, right? So we're incentivized to just look at associations between things. So a lot of the research base upon which we've, we're making these assumptions is, is correlational, right? So we heard this morning uh, from, from a, great, a great talk, you know, from a representative of the WHO um, that was basically built, you know, basically claims that there's higher stroke rates associated with um, pollution, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we actually don't know any of this. So for sure, using experimental data. So let me just walk you quickly through, um, through what you've seen already. And then I'm going to then attack my own presentation and try and critically challenge, it, tr critically challenge what I'm saying and flip everything on its head. Okay, so um, here we go. Uh, this, is a, this is the problem, one of the problems we've created, right? So here, this is 1961 to 1983, female mortality rates by county. These are areas uh, in the salmon colored areas in which there wasn't really an improvement in life expectancy. Now humans, from year to year, life expectancy increases. It's one of the natural things that happens as humans progress. Um, the increase in female life, life expectancy in the leading country has been such a linear and consistent trend that it is the most linear and consistent trend in all of the social sciences. It's like you might as well be in the physical sciences. Life expectancy increases. Um, so uh, this is what we're looking at in the United States uh, in the 1983 to 1999 period. Uh, this is, these salmon colored areas are stagnant areas, and these red color areas are where life expectancy is actually declining. This is unprecedented. This happened in, it's, well, it's not unprecedented, but it's unprecedented in a stable, uh, non-ecological, non-epidemic sort of setting. You know, like you saw some declines in life expectancy in Russia after the fall of the Berlin Wall. You saw it in Sub-Saharan Africa with the outbreak of AIDS. You saw it during World War I. You saw it during World War II. You saw it during the influenza pandemic. But none of that is happening to this country now. And um, one theory is that, uh, that this is happening because we've moved, we've radically changed the way that we were sort of programmed to operate in society. And, and, and America is the cutting edge of this, of this sort of phenomena in which we are moving into cars, into these urban sprawling sort of settings. We're sitting in front of computers all day, and that's what's driving this. Um, and uh, the support of this evidence, there's a lot of things that are sort of supporting it. Um, uh, you know, overall, our health, our health status is going down. Our uh, compensation after health expenditures is declining, meaning that we have less purchasing power and to buy things like food, so these things are sort of spiraling out of control. Um, there's a lot of, there are lots of reasons why this might be happening, um, and uh, a lot of people sort of point towards things like cigarette smoking, et cetera, et cetera. But let me just show you this really quickly. So this is 1975. This is another way of looking at the exact same thing that I just showed you, except from an international perspective. Um, what we're looking here at here is a percentage of uh, women surviving 15 years on the bottom. It goes from 91 to 95. And then here's per capita expenditures. You see the United States is in the pack there in 1975. You know, women, 45-year-old women are less likely to make it 15 years than in these other countries, but about the same. 
And the United States is a little bit below Switzerland in terms of health expenditures. And then by 2005, we see that the United States is way behind its game. Uh, you know, really lost ground, way by far an outlier, both in terms of female survival and healthcare expenditures. This is not a story about healthcare expenditures. Um, it may be a story about obesity, but in that same time interval, uh, other countries have had higher increases in obesity. This is a bubble diagram. You see that the black at the top is Australia. They've experienced a much much more rapid gain in obesity over that time period, but yet Australia, you know, is 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 one of the uh, healthiest countries in this pack, um, and has been uh, uh, over this time period. It's probably not necessarily an obesity story. Cigarette consumption is going down. Sam Preston will argue that cigarette, you know, driven thing, but it's you know we we're not we're not seeing declines in life expectancy due to cigarette consumption, you know, our past cigarette consumption alone. Um, something very strange is going on here. Uh, I'm just going to skip over this slide really quickly um, and show you some of the things we talked about this morning. Here are some mock-ups of what our communities can actually look like if we rethink, re rethink them and redesign them and redevelop, re redevelop them. Um, you've seen a few of these examples today. This is Oakland. You know, throw some, throw, throw some public transit in there and it looks a little bit better. Um, but you still don't want to walk around in this neighborhood, throw some trees in there, you still don't want to walk around, though it does look better, you'd rather live in this neighborhood, but you, you create like a sort of low-rise, mixed-use um, neighborhood in which people live, work, and shop in their neighborhood and walk upstairs. This is a healthier neighborhood. This is very logical. You know, maybe we don't need randomized controlled trials uh, to look at this problem, but we do need to think a little bit, uh, to think about this as a potential solution, but we do need to think more critically about it than we are. Here's some other mock-ups. Uh, Walnut Creek before, after Arlington, Virginia before, after. Um, I think in, 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 in all of these sort of uh, mock-ups, all of us would rather live in the after, right? And and, 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 and we might be able to say like, well, you know, it's very intuitive that we're gonna be healthier in these after communities. There's clearly gonna be less pollution. There's clearly gonna be more opportunities for exercise, clearly gonna get us out of the house, Cle uh, clearly gonna get us out of the apartment, right? I mean, out of our car, right? So uh, yes, maybe, but um, there are also distributional effects here, right? So in these old neighborhoods, uh, people live there and those people are disappearing, right? So we're not looking at these problems through the eyes of the people that we're impacting alone. Um, and uh, some, of the, uh, some of the speakers today have addressed this, saying we need mixed-use housing. That's one solution to this problem. But we need to think about that. We need to think about who, what are the distributional effects of everything that we're doing. We need to think about what are the temporal effects of everything that we're doing, right? So, you know, these things that we're doing, are causing changes um, in the environment. And, and uh, um, you know, again, it's not like going back to, uh, you know, to 1975. This is a picture of, of China, actually, in, in 2000. It's not like going back to the time before we had, you know, sort of become dependent upon the automobile. This is a Chinese bike lane. This is the way that much of Beijing looked back in the old days um, when people were still bicycle dependent and not car dependent, and a lot of these old bike lanes have now been removed and turned into motorways. Changing these bike lanes into motorways is destructive. Changing the motorways back into bike lanes is also disruptive, and it's probably disruptive in a good way, but we have to think about the cyclical effects. What does this do to gentrify the neighborhood? What does this do to displace people? Uh, do we really know that getting people on bicycles is a good idea? It discourages walking. Like, I'm a biking advocate. I bike to work 25 miles to and from Chinatown to Columbia every day. I love my bicycle. But bicyclists are disruptive to walkers. It's also, oh, <laughs> it's also, um, it's also, uh, uh, you know, creates potentials for getting into accidents and things like that. So. Over time, there are cyclical effects and impacts of these things, and we just need to think about them. Okay, so now that I've gotten my warning, uh, I just want to sort of emphasize the main points of the stuff that I've that I've talked about today. First of all, is that um, you know this this all sounds good, but we don't exactly know how this impacts health. There's no randomized trial that says 
that, uh, you know, that, that environmental change or even diet or exercise or anything will actually have any meaningful impact on, on obesity over time. Diets can reduce obesity over the short term, not over time. We also don't know how this impacts health. It impacts health in a lot of different ways and the net is probably good, but we really need to understand that a lot better. We also, don't need, to, we also need to know how this impacts uh, people's quality of life. What are the distributional effects when you, you know, this, this increases health disparities. And uh, we know that health disparities um, are a major, major driver of, uh, of lost years of life in this country and over time. Um, so, you know, we need, we need policies on top of these policies to sort of mitigate um, the long-term harms of the things that we're doing. Uh, how does this affect, affect the elderly? How does it affect, not that you're elderly, Dr. Freed, but you study elderly people. Um, <laughs> how does this affect the elderly when we're, you know, when we're putting in stairways into buildings? Um, how does it impact um, uh, disabled people? We have to think about these things. And uh, we get really excited about you know, these, um, these, these ideas, and we jump into them, but we really have to be a little bit more contemplative about them. So, um, you know, what are the solutions? We don't need more research. We need more quality research. We need more, more randomized trials, and it is possible to, uh, to, to do really innovative things with randomized trials, um, both in terms of looking at our environments and random assignments, looking at randomly assigning developers to do things, but also in terms of randomly assigning participants to receive uh, uh, health interventions and looking to see if those people that live near a park or a bikeway are actually more likely to use them than people that don't. That's one way of finding out if this stuff is effective. Um, we don't need more policies. Policies just increase uh, bureaucracy. We, we really need more clever policies. And we need to think in more, we need to think not just in three dimensions, but we need to think in four dimensions. We need to think about how these things unfold over time and how those things unfold over time. So, you know, a lot of people today, in, including Gina, had talked about you know, how trees, putting in trees has an unintended consequence of increasing allergies, but what about generational effects? You know, allergens, when, uh, when kids are exposed to allergens, they're less likely to have allergies. So if we're thinking about reducing allergens today, we're also gonna create future generations of allergic people. So we have to think about these things in really complex and clever ways. And the third point, that I wanted to just drive home is that we need to think through the eyes of the people that are impacted by the policies that we're creating. Um, you know, uh, 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 the, the example of BRAC, you know, it's, it's amazing the things that BRAC is doing um, in terms of slum removal, but, uh, but, but the Chinese model has shown us that, that actually um, slums, you know, a lot of people have said, well, slums are here, here with us to stay. Slums are not here with us to stay. You know, we're, we're seeing a convergence. Poverty, poverty rates are plummeting globally. Uh, female literacy rates are climbing. Fertility rates are declining. We're moving towards becoming a wealthy world with no slums, even as people, even as poor people urbanize. Uh, we're moving towards becoming a wealthy world. And we need to think about how this, how these policies are impacting people, not, um, not from a 20 story foot high window of a BRAC office looking down into the community, but from within the communities themselves. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I think they're great. Uh, that's a hard act to follow. I promise not to call anyone elderly, even if you are elderly. Um, so, uh, so what I want to uh, touch upon uh, is that basically uh, I and many others have this idea that more dense urban living uh, is better for us economically, um, socially, in terms of public health, and I would attach very much to that, not just public health, but public joy. And that's a term that I like to use because I think sometimes we can get caught up in the statistics and, and, and all of these things that don't necessarily speak to people in a way that uh, really ties to their lives. And we hear a lot about urbanization um, in the world today, but you know there are a lot of questions about the form of the urbanization. And we don't know what this future really looks like as people move into cities around the world. And it's a term that I affectionately call globurbia, uh, because a lot of it is actually suburban growth. This is outside of Riyadh. 
Uh, uh, this is, the, of course, the famous helicopters flying over the choke traffic of Sao Paulo. Um, and, and even some of our most famous architecture looking at what the condition is when it meets the ground and how walkable that place is. And the thing that I find quite common, whether this is in the center of a place like Beijing or outside of uh, the outskirts of Saudi Arabia in, in Riyadh or something like that, is that it's all auto-oriented. Uh, what Peter just said is exactly correct. The world is getting wealthier. Huge numbers of people are moving into the middle class. And the resource usage that's a pertinent to that is something that we're really not thinking about at a global level. And I think there are clearly public health issues associated with it that we're not thinking about. And so we've had a couple of uh, uh, famous mayors from Bogota that have tried to remind us that uh, a, a rich country is not a place where the poor people have cars, but rather where, uh, where rich people use mass transit. Um, this was a great picture from a, from a New York Times uh, article that had nothing to do with any of this, but it was just about a software entrepreneur in Mumbai who happily was taking, well, I don't know about happily, but who was taking mass transit into work the other day, that day. Uh, unlike most upper class Indians who would never be caught dead uh, on, on that train. Um, well, they might even be caught dead, actually. Um, <laughs> but despite those images of that globurbia, the problem is we tend to have a knee jerk reaction that says, well, this is what we should want, right? This is, of course, Thoreau living in something that looks akin to a Unabomber shack uh, <laughs> out near Walden Pond. Um, and this is hardly sustainability. I mean, this is this confusion we have with this idea that by seeing trees, we're somehow living a green life, which of course is the furthest thing from the truth. And the reason it's the furthest thing from the truth is that you can take the carbon footprint of your average suburban house and you can add a lot of bells and whistles in terms of uh, uh, windmills and solar panels and you notice that you barely make a dent in the carbon footprint uh, of, that, of those occupants. But when you use this sort of age old technology of density and mass transit, you immediately starting start to see shifts at scale and that if you then really apply technology, get better forms of mass transit, get dense green buildings in the heart of cities, you're really looking at how to address the environmental problem at scale. Um, and in those cities, we've also seen some very interesting things happen in terms of health and joy. Of course, the biggest one in this country being the drop in violent crime that's happened in city after city uh, uh, since really the 80s. Um, uh, and, and I don't have to tell most of you this, I'm sure you know these statistics about the correlation between obesity and uh, distance from the inner city. And it's interesting, it's not exactly a correlation in the sense that I think there are some socioeconomic factors that play into what happens in the deep inner city. Uh, but clearly you start to see as you get out to the exurbs that there's a correlation between obesity and distance from the inner city. And then of course, um, and this is where the joy factor comes in. This was a Swedish study that showed that commuting distances um, actually increased uh, divorce rates and marital tension. Um, so absence does not make the heart grow fonder. Um, and then, of course, there is driving itself, uh, which is the number one uh, cause of infant mortality around the world, not HIV AIDS, not malaria, but auto accidents. Uh, and it is the most dangerous thing we do uh, with our kids. Um, I have kids in New York um, uh, every day. And so, um, you know, this is why I think that uh, most young people today are looking at, at that 20th century technology of that suburban house and that office park and trying to find a different way of life that does bring health and joy and let you have a glass of wine before you get on the trolley and not have to think twice about it. And it uh, does something that I think is critical for health and joy, which is give you more time. Uh, which is, I think, the, the, the biggest uh, kind of uh, resource that we have in a service economy is time, which is why you see in this country, city after city, not necessarily on the coast, but across the country, building extraordinary pieces of public landscape. You see them building extraordinary pieces of public architecture in terms of culture, new waterfronts. Um, and it's all, I think, with this idea that um, sustainability uh, is akin to density. And that, that doesn't mean that we all have to live in big cities. But if you think about small town life, this is a typical Japanese farm where you see you've escaped the madness of the Jeffersonian grid. And so here, and this is very akin to actually the farming village that my father was born in in India where the farmers cluster together and the, the fields are farmed around that cluster. And that there's, a, a, there's an inherent social and cultural framework to that cluster. 
Um, and this is something that I think we need to start thinking about in our cities. Um, so if you look at a city like New York, our, our city basically was built around the classic hub and spoke model. We had a couple of central business districts, all the infrastructure is uh, really designed to bring you from bedroom communities into those business districts. So what's great about a city like New York is it's got the highest modal transit share of uh, public transit in the country, about 80% in our CBDs, which is great. A lot of people use mass transit here. Uh, what's not so great is we have some of the longest commutes in the United States. Uh, and so you have people commuting on transit for as long as an hour, sometimes more, and that creates all sorts of family stress, um, home life stress, and so forth. Um, and I think what's fascinating is if you think about the last 10 years in this city, that we now have this condition where there are people, for instance, who live in Brooklyn and work in Brooklyn and come to Midtown Manhattan once every six months and kind of think of Central Park as a prison rec yard. Um, that uh, basically they've refashioned the way in which you think about the city, not as that hub and spoke model, but as a series of nodes in which you can live and work and walk your kid to school and get to the supermarket and not really even necessarily have to worry about getting on an aging and underfunded infrastructure system, but actually just taking your bike from your, um, your office to your, uh, to your home. Um, and it's interesting, we recently did a study at Cure which said that, uh, that actually showed that in the digital economy, in the tech economy, that 70% of tech space is in landmark buildings, 85% of tech space is in pre-war buildings. So that starts to tell you that this is a different kind of world that, that these younger companies want to live in. And so I'm just going to close by showing two projects that I think kind of emulate this idea. And forgive me, these are projects from my practice, which I usually don't show in an academic setting. But I think they just so talk about what's happening in our city and cities around the country. This is the Williamsburg Bridge. This is the Lower East Side. It's Williamsburg in Brooklyn. So this is the Domino Sugar uh, uh, Refinery. And this is Seward Park. And both of them have had a lot of publicity in the last uh, few months. So you may have read about them. Um, so starting with Seward Park, uh, this is an area that has had uh, an extraordinarily difficult history. It was an urban renewal site. Puerto Rican families were forcibly evicted from these sites. Uh, they've been empty parking lots for years. It was a very, very difficult uh, uh, community, really driven process to get redevelopment on these sites, starting with the relocation of the Essex Street Market. And so the, what, I, what I find so interesting about this project is it starts with food, uh, which I love. Um, and it starts with food tied to the subway system and we've had this whole idea of this light scoop and bringing in light into the market as a sort of sense again of public health and joy. So all the south facing um, uh, glazing actually lets light into this circulation zone that connects to the subway and also this proposal for the low line and a series of rooftops that are actually going to be used as urban farms. And I think this is really interesting when at a school like GSAP when people start talking about things like urban farming on roofs and everyone thinks they're crazy five years ago and then the next thing you know, five years later, developers are actually building it. Uh, and I find that to be very, very fascinating. Um, and so that's the section through that entire uh, project. Um, so this is, we're not designing uh, most of these buildings, actually we're designing the Warhol Museum over here. And then these are a series of affordable housing projects. There are 50, 30, 20 projects, 50% market, 30% middle income, 20% low income. And this is actually a senior housing facility with uh, social services in it. Um, and what is also fascinating, sorry, is that these, this is all workspace in here. So it's housing, this market, and then workspace that's baked in. And again, this idea that you don't have to go to midtown Manhattan to get to work. Uh, I think is a really critical idea for this uh, coming uh, uh, decade. Um, so this is the inside coming off the subway system and making that a great experience that kind of celebrates the subway. Um, rooftop gardens that are winter gardens that are again south facing with, uh, with seasonal plantings. And this is the view from the south including a new park uh, as well as uh, a view of those winter gardens and the sort of local retail along the shop level. So this went through an extensive community board uh, process that we were very proud of. The other one on the other side of the Williamsburg Bridge, this is Domino, uh, and this is the Domino Sugar Refinery right here, um, which has been closed for many years, has had also a very difficult history. Uh, this is what that site looks like today, actually. Uh, and uh, this is uh, largely, um, 
uh, a Latino community that lives in this neighborhood that's been cut off from this quarter mile of waterfront for most of their history. Um, and uh, a very, very difficult rezoning went through uh, in 2010 um, for about three million square feet of new housing uh, here. And what was interesting is that it was almost all housing with kind of a Duane Reed on the bottom. And that was called mixed use. Uh, I don't think that's what Jane Jacobs meant. Um, and the other thing is a lot of the housing was in the floodplain. Uh, and so this site changed ownership to Two Trees, where the folks also operate Dumbo. And they came to us and they said, we hate this plan. It's kind of a suburban plan. We hate it. Uh, we need to build three million square feet, though. Um, and so they said, why don't we go through the whole city planning process again, which is kind of like holding a gun to your head, but they really wanted to do it. Um, and what we had to argue for, and it was interesting in Peter's presentation, he talked about low rise, I think he used the word, and we actually argued for more height here. Uh, and we argued for more height on the grounds that would actually loosen up more of the ground plane for park space and for community uses. And we actually tried to aerate these buildings to bring light and air back into the community uh, and raised all the mechanical equipment out of the floodplain. And with field operations, proposed about six and a half acres of new parkland including, it's been, there's been an interesting conversation about what's lawn and what's um, hardscape. This is going to be hardscape because the community very much wants a farmer's market. And so again, that sort of tie to food and how one designs space in terms of allowing access to uh, resources like that. The other thing that is a very big difference from the former plan is that the refinery site, which is a landmark, as well as this building, will be new office space. There'll be about 600,000 square feet of office space. Now, if someone told me 10 years ago that we were going to be building new office space on the Williamsburg waterfront in Brooklyn, I would have told them that they were completely insane. Um, and this, to me, points to a very different kind of city, a, a live-work city where, again, people don't have to get on the morning train and the L train, which is very congested, and come into uh, Manhattan to work. Um, so this is what the plan looks like. It's supposed to go through city council um, uh, next week. There's lots of things I could tell you about it. But I think the thing that's very interesting to me is when the site is built out, it will have twice the number of workers that it had in 1960. It's a different kind of work. But I think that as we are now entering this new administration and there's all this talk about affordable housing and equity and so forth, very good conversation to have. We need to remember that there's an ecology to people's lives. It's not just housing, but how they actually move around the city and, and use the city. Uh, so there are schools here. Um, the community, which voted 25 to 9 in favor of the plan, wanted things like fishing piers and kayaking and lots of urban activity along the new waterfront. Uh, and really wanted to see that landmark be the epicenter of the plan. Um, and so uh, this is just one last rendering that shows a couple in Manhattan wishing they lived in Brooklyn. Uh, <laughs> these are not shy buildings. These are big buildings. But the point that big buildings can also tie to a sense of public health and joy is something that is at least our hypothesis for, for this project. And I'll just close with this last slide that says that, you know, cities, I think we still have not even begun to understand the potential that cities have as the vehicle for delivering better economic, uh, public, and, and, and sort of societal health in terms of social mobility. Uh, we can get there. We have the tools. We sort of know what they are, I think, at this point. But what we really aren't, don't do is we don't have the governance structure. We're still, we have a governance model that's built around a kind of 1950s pre, uh, excuse me, post-war era, as well as a, a, a kind of consumer culture that's built around the 1950s post-war era. And I think with the millennials, you're going to start to see that change, and we're going to uh, head towards a different kind of city. Thank you.
to uh, start um, again. Say, what a hard act to follow. Uh, what several hard acts to follow, but um, I'm going to start um, to um, tell you about my practice, um, precisely to try to concretize and um, promote uh, civic innovation uh, in. I think this is building on the question at the end of the last, the last question at the end of the last session. Um, and uh, some very modest um, small scale projects to explore how we can reimagine our relationship to natural systems substantively. So, beyond the bike lane is one of my um, uh, ideas. And I work, uh, frame my practice at NYU in something called the Environmental Health Clinic, which is um, quite literally to. Um, twist the definition of health, um, one that's um, not, you know, away from the medicalized, pharmaceuticalized, uh, individualized, atomized, genetically predetermined idea of health to one that's external, that's in the air in this room, it's in the food systems we depend on. So this twist of the definition of health is um, what I um, meet. Uh, I have, I don't have, I don't have patients who come to my clinic uh, I have impatients because they're too impatient to wait for legislative change or uh, uh, so-called due process. And I work a lot with other institutional contexts um, and with non-human um, collaborators. Um, I call this uh, developing another in the realm of institutional critique, um, reimagining how we cohabit with urban biodiversity. Um, I call this ooze, or the Bronx ooze, zoo backwards and without cages, and about promoting healthy urban habitat for non-humans. Um, every clinic has to have a pharmacy, so I'll start with uh, this project too. You can see these are all kind of in the, in the context of reinventing institutions, um, health clinics, zoos, and a pharmacy, which from the misspelling you can see, is actually about exploring food and food systems that not only reduce food miles and reduce petrochemical fertilizers and reduce you know, pesticides and all the good things that the food movement uh, does internationally, which is probably the biggest social movement in the world, I would say, but actually food and food systems that measurably increase biodiversity, improve water quality, increase soil um, biodiversity, et cetera. So pharmacy starts with a very simple project we've been doing um, for a number of years um, with these ag bags, which uses existing hard infrastructure to adapt um, thin air, any railing, parapet, or windowsill into arable territory. Um, of course, uh, there's a lot of um, reasons why these demonstrate closed system agriculture, which is not familiar e even to um, organic farmers. And the big question of uh, why to do this is, is, of course, the only known technology we have for improving uh, air quality, the only demonstrated technology for improving air quality. And given that, you know, with our correlation studies, the better predictor for your life expectancy is how close you live to a major arterial road than, than your genetic, pre um, your genes as far as it's been demonstrated. Um, uh, air quality is an um, interesting issue, and the only, the only technology we have to hand is leaf area index. So um, this makes a radically inexpensive way to, um, to create high shoot to root ratio plants and support them in an um, uh, intense root environment where the, the um, Tyvek that we're using has micropores so it breathes. That's actually all aerated soil all around there as opposed to the rhizomic inch or two on the top. Um, but the big critique of urban agriculture, which I think is a very fair one, and uh, um, is why <laughs> you know, the yields are you know, small. If you, uh, why all the hipsters in rooftop farms in Brooklyn are directly competing with the struggling rural farm seven miles up the Hudson, you know, in Rockland County who are selling out to fracking because they don't have the preferential access to chefs, they don't have the hundreds, literally hundreds of volunteers, not farm laborers, volunteers working on their hands and feet to, uh, hands and knees to, to directly compete and undermine these uh, rural food shed. But the, the big question with urban agriculture is what do you grow that actually you know, improves their quality, improves the soil-based system, builds soil, and uh, is a delicious edible that doesn't, in a non-compete rule. High nutrition value, high commercial value, highly perishable, non-distributable goods, right? Or, in other words, flowers. Um, flowers are the most nutrient-dense foods we know of. They're high color, signals high, powerful antioxidants and lycopenes and 
with the urban body, of course, assaulted by um, uh, urban contaminants. This is a, a big thing. So most people don't know how to use flowers, so this is a really a, it's a cultural adventure in how to reimagine the use of flowers, but it does start to take urban surfaces and um, look at what they um, might look like, all these found um, structures. And I've currently got a proposal into, uh, this is a deployment I'm doing in, this is a Photoshop, the rest weren't, this is currently what I'm trying to do in London. I have the permissions not quite um, through, but, um, but, and I also have a proposal to JFK, which is our front door, right? It'd be nice to have flowers there, and the air quality in this area is so tremendously compromised that it um, would be, I think, powerfully important to see what effect we could have by um, greening these things. But um, so f fostering uh, the other, the other non-humans that really enjoy flowers, of course, are pollinators, and we're in the midst of a pollinator crisis, the size and scale of which we've never seen before, um, so we're supporting urban biodiversity. Um, and of course, for volunteers interested in, in farming, it's much better to do it while, while repelling than doing it on your hands and knees. And, um, so uh, these ag bags are, the, this sort of food experimentation has come out of um, how do we use flowers beyond decorating a cupcake or sprinkling it on a salad. Um, and see so these cola manufactories are some things we've tried which using open source cola. A manufactory is a, a mashup between an assembly line and a party. So it's, you move along and you squirt in your pre-measured uh, amounts of syrup and sugar. I put in some other benign ingredients like um, New England aster flower tincture to make love cola. The Iroquois used it as a, a powerful love potion and it's also an antiviral. Um, or happy cola is with St. John's wort tincture added. So these are um, lots of fun. Um, another example is the flower floss. This is not sugar, this is isomalt, which um, for those of you with the sluggish gut, you'd be familiar with, right? Um, it's a major ingredient in Metamucil, right? Um, it's optically clearer when we um, use it uh, as a, a floss, which stands for Free Libra Open Source Systems. We um, sprinkle it with bee pollen and put on some um, <laughs> some edible flowers, um, and of course we uh, provide a, a taste of of a biodiverse future. That not only this food, the cultivation and and consumption of it is, um, you know, it fosters biodiversity in your lower gut. It acts like a fiber, right? So you're farming your lower gut, right, with the isomalt. But you're also fostering biodiversity in your local urban environment, right? So this carnivalesque food, this taste of the future, this idea of a good good that adds up to significant environmental effect. Oh, but I've had actually a really big problem with these manufactories where I get people to, you know, make their labor in food production radically transparent by doing it themselves in that people screw it up. <laughs> you know, it's extraordinary how much they spill and don't press down the syringe enough. You know, um, learning that, of course, assembly line, low-paid assembly line work is not at all unskilled, right? And so I decided I needed Oompa Loompas to help with the food production, and so I formed a musical theater company called <laughs> Child Labor, and now child labor actually assemble, they work in these assembly lines um, in musical but efficient assembly lines, assembling the good goods, and of course their baffled parents and their adoring community can purchase the goods that they are providing. This is all open accounting, colonomics really works, selling flavored water, um, particularly that's healthy and uh, the cola, co well, I'll tell you about the cola cola, putting the cola back in cola, but this idea of micro-enterprise, hyper-local inve investment, um, and generating profits um, in a way that actually diverts it from large corporate, you know, it's no accident that selling a flavored water is um, profitable enough to build multinational corporations out of, but it might also be profitable enough to, for small communities. Um, this is another child labor project, um, and I'm currently in a war with the MTA on this. This uses solar chimneys and other collection devices to actually use um, electrostatic precipitators, charge plates, et cetera, to grab that black carbon, that ultrafine particulate matter that is the largest um, pollutant by surface area and by mass and 
ultra unregulated, below 2 PM 2.5, entering into our cardiovascular system, implicated in the breast cancer epidemic, the obesity epidemic, the asthma epidemic, etc. All the things that you know. But the ESPs, of course, grab this grime. Um, and I've been negotiating with the MTA to put on an ESP, a small ESP, on one of the vents of the largest pollution source in New York City, which is the Midtown Tunnel, where all the diesel trucks go through. Um, for security reasons, I've been, um, since September 11th, I've been told I can't have access to it, and um, which is a great way to show how little the MTA is doing to, they have no filtration whatsoever, no intention of doing it, and they're obstructing research that could, I mean, anyway. Um, the idea of this project is we collect the black grime that changes the reflectors of the atmosphere and changes the color of snow, is a big coupling driver, the amorphous black carbon, and we bind it into a pencil, the length of which measures the amount of grime we've inexpensively pulled out of the air. So these pencils, uh, these pollution pencils, take a pollutant and help us get a handle on just exactly how, um, what these particulates are materially, um, what they, how they work. Here's the child labor involved in some of the prototypes. Uh, uh, I wanted to um, show you this um, project to, okay, I'm gonna skip through. Um, let me show you some technology for non-humans to value and um, realize the um, asset of urban biodiversity. Uh, again, you probably know this, but you know the biggest citizen science um, count that was done, uh, coordinated in, uh, by the UNEP in Paris, looked at the pollinators in metropolitan Paris versus the surrounding rural agriculture area and found what we all aren't surprised by, but the species number and the species population were all higher in metropolitan Paris than the surrounding agricultural area. Um, so how do we value biodiversity? This is, these are perches for, uh, obviously for pigeons. They work by a bird lands on the perch and um, when they do, it'll play something like this. Now here's what you need to do. Go down there and buy some of those health food bars, the ones you call bird food, and bring it here and scatter it around. There's a good person. Actually, I've set these up in a number of different places, and each, each um, perch has a different argument on it. Um, I like the one about the, the uh, you know, copyright dues for all the melodic resources borrowed for sing, uh, cell phone ringtones and things, but the birds actually favored, they could you know, figure out which argument best elicited cooperative behavior. Birds could experiment on people, and they decided that this was the perch that actually about eight to one they preferred. It was ast astounding, and it said this. Tick, tick, tick. That's the sound of genetic mutations, of the avian flu becoming a deadly human flu. Do you know what slows it down? Healthy subpopulations of birds, increasing biodiversity generally. It is in your interests that I am healthy, happy, well fed. Hence, you could share some of your nutritional resources instead of monopolizing them. That is, share your lunch. Okay. Okay, I'm going to skip through this because I actually am running out of time on my um, the nutrition facts and um, uh, ways that we can actually simply stitch together and support urban biodiversity. Butterfly bridge is one good example. Butterflies are attracted and, of course, bounce across instead of being smeared on your windscreen, um, connecting patches of viable habitat um, and making the fleeting presence of these valuable pollinators much more present. Uh, this is a banner permit. You can get these up in your community if, if you want to know. Um, uh, the Salamander Superhighway, I will skip over. The Moth Cinema, I think, is, uh, actually I don't want to skip over this one the, um, because it's an important way to look at how civic innovation happens. This is a biochar augmented area. Uh, biochar is produced from a waste energy process that um, in this case, I invited people to bring muni their municipal or divert municipal cellulosic waste, their junk mail, actually, uh, business correspondence mail, I think it is, um, and their old thesis papers and dissertations and things. And we incinerated it in the pyrolysis biochar stove 
which produces this biochar that you know, sequesters carbon for you know, 5,000 million years, who's counting at that point, um, and um, augments the soil. You can see we've got a 40% increase in growth, 15 extra species in this area. And what I do is I ask people to bring this material and, um, and then we have a kind of convivial social context where we can talk about um, this on the biochar barbecue. I also get a, a salsa DJ, so we have a biochar cha and we discuss what it takes to, there's five subcontractors in picking up and handling the recycled paper waste from Long Island City. And my rough calculations was just from the cellulosic waste, we could generate enough energy to do all the public and private lighting in Long Island City from the local waste generated. So how do we explore and generate these viable moves towards distributed local energy production that actually improve health and don't have those diesel trucks picking up um, paper. It just makes no sense to, to distribute waste, right? Similarly, Moth Cinema, a, a screen that hangs in the park. It's illuminated after dark according to the screening schedule, but instead of being bedazzled and fried by the light, they, the moths find a moth garden for, with nectar plants and host plants so that they play out their nightly dramas, their dramatic shadows, are cast um, their love triangles, um, they're all against the screen. And we, of course, can use this as a way to demonstrate this was the first lunar moth seen in New York City in 40 years at the Moth Cinema in Socrates um, Park. Um, to demonstrate uh, why don't all our parks have this kind of real-time display of the success and support of... of um, I'm going to skip over, there's a whole lot of sports that I think radically change what we think of as, you know, I think this promoting stairs is such an impoverished way to promote health um, when we could really redesign sports that don't degrade environmental health. Why? You know, it just doesn't make any sense. I'll, I'm going to skip over the rhinoceros beetle wrestling. I'll just give you um, a little peek into what that sport is, um, but give you um, um, one example of, of um, these are the exercise programs that the clinic does for community members that, um, that have um, a sh a environmental and human health benefit. Um, so these are um, just, the, actually the most, all of the e exercises have a human and environmental health benefit. The favorite here is, um, uh, Hula hooping, because I think people are really interested in core body conditioning or the six pack, right? But our hula hoops are adapted with New England wildflower seeds. So as you're hula hooping, you're spreading perennial resources for, for these um, valuable pollinators. And I found that even boys, even though they're genetically, I don't know, not wired to hula hoop, <laughs> they have some, uh, anyway, even boys actually got into this. And you're more likely to go back next Saturday to see what effect you've had on the local environment. Uh, again, concrete examples to explore lifestyle experiments of what it's like to have a, a tree office. And this was a tree office that uh, explored visibility and floodability, similar to the scheme the, um, that we just saw, um, but as a, as a co-working space in a tree, uh, just a delightful office. It was my, I worked there for a summer, the clinic field office. and. Um, and the conceit of this is that it was owned and operated by the tree, right? The tree was the landlord, uh, so you paid your hot desking, co-working fees to the tree. And it made a lot of sense to have a tree as landlord. And, uh, and it makes much more sense than, uh, and that was of course after the precedent of this tree, the tree that owns itself in Athens, Georgia. Has anyone been to this tree? Um, deeded to itself by Colonel William Jackson in 1832, it and the eight-foot plot around it. And uh, then it died, and the Junior Ladies Gardening Club came along in 1946 and replanted an acorn of that tree back on the same plot of land. And so the tree, they tested heritability laws, and the tree that owns itself continues to own itself, and actually shows us a really viable alternative to the environmental services model that we use to value trees and other organisms in our, where a New York City tree for all the carbon sequestering, pollutant capture, particulate, mobilization, habitat provisioning, shade and energy saving, stormwater retention, all of the services that it provides, $400 over an 80-year lifespan, which is just not consistent with um, my sense of value of a, of a tree. Um, and 
and what is it? This the tree, the tree office. We're putting up a couple more tree offices um, around NYU. There's students who are interested in doing them, but. Um, the, the tree and Socrates uh, earn $400 a month just in co-working space fees. And what did it do with those trees, those, that profit? It did biochar augmenting the soil around it. It did some companion planting. It sent three of its offspring to college. One went to Cornell and one went to Rutgers. One went to NYU and didn't do very well. But these, This is actually much more in tune with the Bolivian Rights of Earth document of extending rights discourse to non-humans which of course seems absurd to begin with, as it did when, when giving women vote or, or other, um, uh, and it could be viable. And coming up for the Paris Convention is um, in, in important to explore. I've actually been asked to stop. I'm going to um, uh, finish with just one, um, one quick last project about um, you know reimagining more radical ways to reimagine mobility to regain the wonder of flight. Um, sorry, uh, with um, some you know the whole class of new aircraft um, that have um, the light sport aircraft that have come onto the market, um, sort of rethinking how we integrate them into our urban environment. Um, what it looks like. Um, I uh, flew hundreds of people um, through downtown Toronto on these 16-foot wingspan wings um, <coughs> to, you know, to explore. This is over Nathan Phillips Square, past City Hall, through downtown Toronto to explore what a fast, radically inexpensive, emissionless mobility can look like. And um, I would call this a a public spectacle, yes, but a shared public memory um, of a possible future to really start to rethink what does it mean to have, to get beyond the bike lane and to playfully reimagine um, what's possible and how that applies in, in um, a, m a more urban scale, which I think is maybe difficult for people to Extrapolate. I will have you know that grandmothers were our most avid flyers in this. They were the ones that lined up the longest and kept coming back. Um, so, um, but this is a, this elevator project that I've recently had um, uh, some um, investment in is a extended elevator that goes 30% higher than a building. Right. Um, this is. Uh, because of the technological opportunity of heat actuated. Um, uh, you don't. You no longer have to isolate a shaft, which is what we've been doing for many years with heat actuated smart sensors. We can isolate the shaft in the event of a fire, and the rest of the time we can use it with the oldest technology we know in architecture, which is the shaft effect. Um, and with that, with a 30% head going up for a ride in an elevator, producing the view, right? The elevator becomes a destination, not just a route from A to B. We, that 30% head is enough to um, provide ventilation, uh, uh, passive ventilation. Um, but it also, of course, starts to, this is the case study of, of sorry, of um, Tomcat Bakery, which has 76 diesel trucks every morning delivering fresh artisanal airy bread all over New York City and 76 tr um, trucks worth of diesel fumes to Long Island City residents. Um, and by extending that extra freefall, um, we have tipped the balance. The elevator now becomes a power plant for that, um, that building, and you've produced access to the roof. And for less than the cost of one of those trucks maintenance for one year, you can put a zip line down to the, the water where you can, with higher throughput, higher reliability, distribute goods over water, which we know is the raison d'etre of New York City and so many other of these cities. So I am um, going to stop um, with uh, just this uh, teaser image, actually, uh, the, um, to say that small projects that demonstrate materially uh, how we can explore viable alternatives to really taste what a biodiverse future looks like, to really um, imagine, test, 
in the irreducible complexity of cities, messy cities, the messy cities that I promote, um, in the, uh, the you know, facing the tremendous challenges, I think it is this model of small-scale experiments that raise standards of evidence, that enlist diverse communities into what is possible, what is desirable, and really expands the possibilities. And I would argue that all of this, any of this, anything goes in terms of design, uh, it's, um, in terms of innovation, in terms of play and wrestling rhinoceros beetles or feeding fish, if we can measurably improve human and environmental health. Because that is the proxy for the common good that we can all agree on. And if we can agree on that, then we don't have to micromanage the kinds of designs that um, are you know, trying to quite deliberately um, improve health. We can open up to the diversity and really the wonder of a complex urban ecosystem. Thank you. Okay, if I just ask the speakers to come back up to the front. I think we can, uh, for sake of time, uh, I'm not sure if any of the panelists would like to ask each other a question or have a comment, but I think we could just open it up for two questions to the audience, uh, if there are any questions. <laughs> want to try to engage each other, but quickly. Uh, yes. discussion this morning with the mayor of Hoboken, Don Zimmer, who's an extraordinary mayor, and um, you know, we have much more common cause with the city of Hoboken, which is the fourth densest city in the United States, than we do with Ithaca, New York. Ithaca is a lovely place, but it really, you know, if, if, if we had a system in which we had a federal government, a sort of county government, and then regional governments that had home rule in terms of cities, we could not only keep a lot more of the tax money that we send out uh, and therefore be able to pay for the schools and the, uh, and the transit and all the other things that we need, uh, including flowers at, Gen at Kennedy Airport, um, we uh, would clearly be better off, the country would be better off, the citizenry would be better off. Uh, there's a lot of vested interests, uh, not to mention the Constitution of the United States, that keeps us from having uh, that kind of a system. I'd like to add to that. I think that um, you know, what is where do we have agency? Is the question where do we have agency to act and to experiment and to play and to figure this out, right? Because let's let's be honest that none of us know what to do, and you know that's it has to develop out of the complex, messy processes that we value about cities. And um, you know, for example, I was given a class one violation for the facade of flowers that I did on Postmaster's Gallery, which is what they give to construction firms that kill people, right? Um, $200,000 fine, I was up for, I had to go to Department of Buildings Court. Um, and this is, this is actually not state, but this is kind of city legislative. You know, it's because these um, agencies are not really accountable to human environmental health, 
right, as their bottom line, right, that is, it's, they can do inconsistent things that, um, that I think is the power of this particular framing, this particular issue, is that if we take as our king measure, not livability, not green infrastructure, not any of these resilience, all these wishy-washy things that are all great, but you know, there's no way to measure them, right? But you know, with the green ash, with the ash borer evidence of, you know, just removing seven percent of the canopy from cities when the ash borer comes through, and you get significant increases in hospitalization rates for cardiovascular health issues, then there is a much bigger imperative on you know, developers. Do anything you like, as long as you can demonstrably improve human and environmental health Im improvements, air quality improvements, water quality improvements. You know, that, that kind of broad framework can facilitate this, the kind of work that makes sense to us, right? That is not carefully controlled by um, a priori state regulation which, or city regulation. There has to be room and place and uh, importance put on experimentation. Yeah, and, and just to follow that up really quickly, I mean, I think, I think a lot can be accomplished um, by, by streamlining bureaucracies a little bit. Um, just a few tweaks. I mean, we really need these regulatory um, laws in place to protect us and to, play, to protect our democratic institutions. But a lot of them can be rethought and streamlined um, if, it's, if that's done carefully. I mean, I think one of the, one of the, um, the great ideas in, in architecture is green roofs. And most co-ops uh, in, the, in the city that have a lot of roof space, these big Queens co-ops, they can't really do that because the, the process for actually putting a green roof in the top of a garage or the top of their building or whatever is so bureaucratic that it becomes uh, financially and financially onerous to them and also uh, the opportunity cost of the board members who are all volunteers of doing that kind of a thing mm -hmm. is really high. So, you know, policymakers need to think like, well, if we really want to get from here to there um, and still, you know, ensure that there's no corruption, et cetera, et cetera, you know, how can we do, how can we do that um, without putting, you know, without putting uh, too much of an onus on the on the, the participants that are going to benefit from this process. Can I just build on, because I think the green roof example is a really good one, um, uh, because it's insane to build green roofs. I mean, it costs, um, having done a couple of them, you know, it's, you know, to, and retrofitting on existing buildings, it's, you know, probably $100,000 of beam sistering and things to support anything beyond a, you know, an inch and a half of engineered soil, right? At, um, that is then, you know, really a cocktail, you know, a few planters and, the, you know, having a cocktail, you know, on. You know, it, it's, it's not actually the way that green roofs have been promulgated is both expensive and doesn't really address what, will, what if we were trying to maximize the environmental performance of these green roofs, the leaf area index, the biodiversity, the habitat provisioning, what would they look like then? What would it mean to design in that way? And if we had some measure or an imperative, and there's a really nice map that um, a former student of mine has just done using the Google drive-throughs of being able to take leaf area index of each uh, block of just saying, you need to have this much leaf area in your, your block. How you do it, we don't care, right? But to actually have the thing that really matters that has the impact on human health effects, then opens up design possibilities that are much wider than, you know, because of course we've got much more vertical space than we have horizontal space and, and rooftop uh, infrastructure often interferes and, you know, and there's, it's a really complex and interesting design problem that all the renderings that just put the green roofs on d doesn't do justice to, I think, you know. Yeah, you could do it without any load on the roof, but, but then from the city's perspective, like, how do we know we're not going to put any load on the roof if you're actually converting? So you have to be really careful with these things because you do something like that and there's somebody, there's some schmuck out there who's going to, like, use a roof, roof that it wasn't designed to bear a load to put like heavy soil on, you know, so you do have to have some sort of protective uh, legislation in place, but yeah. Okay, any other last questions from the speakers? All right, well I think for time, and we went to hear from Dean Freed and Dean Wigley, I think it's been an extraordinary day and really appreciate all the presentations and the conversation and for sure there are many more questions to come. Thank you.
you for your vision and organizing this. Uh, Mark and I happily are turned into figureheads. Uh, <laughs> well, it's all for me. <laughs> um, but uh, the fact that this was designed to be a conversation, I think, is something we both want to now turn it into with, perha with perhaps some opening remarks and maybe some provocations for all of you to respond to. Uh, is this not working? I think someone turned it off. There uh, we go. Better? No? Let me change. Take this one. Is this? Uh, yes. <laughs> So, um, I, Mark, I'm just reflecting that this conversation today uh, on Earth Day is um, part of a continuum that you and I have been engaged in uh, for several years and in many cities and countries of the world. And so to be able to bring it back home, so to speak, is a pleasure. And I know you've been reflecting on um, our aspiration of bringing together certainly public health and architecture around urban slash health. Uh, you've been reflecting on it a lot, even as you transition to new roles. Um, and so I was wondering if I could pitch the first question to you in terms of how you think this vision has matured even today. Uh, well, I thought it was, uh, it was like judgment. <laughs> I mean, I think it was a great day, and I kept thinking, oh, I wish all the architecture students could listen to this, because I feel like there was such expertise and creativity and coolness and, and ethical responsibility built into everybody's, and I know we could invite more speakers, and there, there really is an, a very substantial community of very creative scientists and designers around the world that, that one thing we have to do, I think, is find ways that all their various discoveries are shared, like some mechanism for, for, for sharing. And, and, and I like some of the points that were coming up at the very end of the conversation, which is about it, it can be better to have a kind of overall goal in mind rather than obsess about the particular pathway by which you get to it. And I think that, that seems to me very important because um, there is this sort of issue of, of, of whether kind of micro strategies would, if, if they were accumulated, lead to an overall gain, or whether in fact uh, the city has, as it were, a capacity to absorb micro adjustments and defeat you in the end. Like is the city itself, in a kind of science fiction movie, a kind of organism that, that will always reformulate itself to to uh, render you unhealthy. And, and so I think there can be something to be said for both public health on the one side and architecture on the other to go back to first principles to clarify what, what would, for example, a concept like healthy cities mean. So at the moment you say cities, people think of like what's outside this building. They think of very substantial kind of infrastructural assemblages of very large amounts of material uh, in increasingly dense formations that are growing very fast uh, and so on. But really the word for, uh, on a kind of first principle basis, city is only a word for that which allows us to live together, right? So city is not a thing or a shape or a form or a, it's, a, it's an ambition. Um, and people go to cities, the reasons that cities are maybe the best idea we ever have and why they are exploding in size is that people go to cities because they think their dreams will be leveraged and cities are thought of as a form of leverage. I mean if I walk uh, 100 meters like in New Zealand where I'm from, from in a farm or whatever in the countryside, you know, I'll see, um, you know, quite a few sheep and, and then my grandfather. And, that, and that's about it, and, you know, and, and, and that's about it. Um, and then if I walk the same 100 meters in almost any city, I will, I will encounter up to 10,000 people very fast. People that are in cars alongside me, people that are walking, people in the stores, people that are living above. So I maximize my connectivity. So I leverage, and, and each contact is an opportunity and a connection, plus I'm radiating my own personal 
beauty or whatever. <laughs> um, so there's an enormous amount of transactions that, go, that are going on. So, so cities, cities uh, leverage connectivity. Um, and in that sense, and maybe I'm kind of trying to answer my own question here, but in that sense, cities are, are like the first form of social media. And, and for me, the biggest thing missing in the conversation today was, was a sort of sense of the non-physical city. It was as if um, cities were full of uh, heavy materials and not full of information um, uh, and, and kind of invisible networks and so on. So, because if a city is that which allows you to share, there's no, and there's no real association bet between a particular physical fabric and that ambition. And since we are increasingly connected electronically, um, whatever the question of public health is, it's going to have a lot to do with that. Um, and then strategies in the social media sphere could be more efficient in terms of attaining health goals than sort of design strategies aimed at the existing uh, fabric. So I think that the, the, it would be important if the architects are going to get together with the public health experts that we don't bring like the most boring image of our own field to you, uh, which is the image of, 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 of heavy, uh, actually indefensible, indefensible investments in uh, energy. And as you probably know, the built fabric of cities is, is the major contributor to, um, to pollution and so on and, and the health consequences that come from that. So basically a sort of um, indefensible uh, physical fabric if we, if we think of that as the city, uh, the starting point is so off track that you may never get to be on track. And I, I, just, I just wanted to remind my fellow architects of how our discipline begins in the so-called West. It begins with a guy called Vitruvius. And Vitruvius was actually not a very good architect, uh, which for those of us who are architectural theorists, this is not a very good thought that um, you know, bad architects make for good theorists. But then it may be true. Um, and he befriended the sister of Augustus Caesar and, and got, managed to get from Augustus a, um, a sort of pension to write. But he was in bad health. He says he basically he was in very bad health and that he hoped that his book would, uh, you know, mm -hmm. allow him to sort of, as it were, live on. But he obsessed with the fact that, that healthfulness was the number one objective of the architect. And so much so that he has extensive chapters dealing with all forms of illness and their likely cause and he recommends um, which color the liver of your cattle should have that would indicate that where the cattle is living would also be a good place for you to live and therefore a good place to sort of <coughs> form your city. So basically architecture begins by ripping over the open the belly of a cow and checking out the uh, liver uh, and, and, and then going from there. So basically, you know, the sort of at the sort of epicenter of, uh, of cities is uh, like a healthy liver. Um, so if you, if you think of it that way, then, then you, you, you could go back to the liver, as it were, and reimagine another city like an entirely different proposition coming out of it. So I think to some extent the sort of urban, practical, tactical strategies of architects can be very, very helpful in synergies with, with health, health experts. But I also think that some of the sort of visionary capacity of architects could be ultimately um, extremely important. And, and realism might not be the perfect companion of healthy cities. A certain degree of, of what used to be thought of as, I mean, given I mean, sort of magical realism, like the sort of, uh, um, because I do, again, I, I want to sort of insist on that point that people come to cities um, imagining that, that their aspirations and ambitions will be elevated. So cities are sp spaces of, uh, of fantasy and of ideas. And so the question is, how, how do you link this almost genetic predisposition towards ideas with physical and mental health in a, in a kind of, you know, epidemiology uh, uh, perspective. So, so what would be sort of um, architectural fantasies with sort of, uh, 
you know, sort of disease implications. And, and, and I think, you know, Arctic Center could be really mobilized for that. I mean, we'd be really willing, willing to do it. And the final point to make about that is, um, if you think that sort of sounds crazy and sort of like, you know, you know who, who, what kind of idiot would propose that imagination would have anything to do with um, uh, dealing with these huge issues, nobody knows what's going on with cities. I mean, it's my job to know this, right? In 2050, um, 70 or 75 percent of the world's population will live in cities. There is no current model of cities that can that allows us to know what that means, right? It, we really have much more confidence about what it means to live on Mars. Almost all of us could sketch out more or less the appropriate life conditions for Mars, which kind of plants, oxygen systems, and so on. Nobody knows what it means to live on Earth in 2050. So actually, radical forms of imagination are going to be necessary. So I think, for example, starting with the beautiful speech at the beginning of the day, these, this, this, these extraordinary trends and data should be, in a, in a way, a kind of call for very, very radical imaginings of, uh, uh, of possible ways that we would live together that would allow some of the consequences of that data to be played out. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of for the fantasy, from the fantasy club. Uh, so um, maybe what I can do is um, say in a couple of minutes to the audience, we're going to challenge you to commit some grand acts of imagination, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, but I, you just, um, sparked a few thoughts in me. First, of course, you're, you're prompting me, Mark, to say that we all want to be healthy livers, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, two opposing images that also come to mind are first that um, the downside of our current urban experiments is, in part, is this dramatic rise, almost pandemic, of obesity around the world. And um, that has untoward consequences unless we correct it in, in these acts of imagination. For example, there's data from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation that businesses are choosing sort of the opposite of looking at the livers of the right. cows. They're looking at the data on the obesity rates of given populations to decide where they don't want to put their businesses. Uh, because the obesity rates are too high in that area and the productivity of their workforce will be too low. Um, it also reminds me of just the example of the school in which I have a privilege to, to work, which, as you remember, um, was actually a building that the school entered about 15 years ago, was, used to be the inpatient New York Psychiatric Institute and um, when the psychiatric inpatients got a better building to live in, the public health school got to move in. And it turns out that, that, New York, that inpatient psychiatric buildings 100 years ago were, were designed by architects very effectively to keep people apart. And we spend our lives trying to overcome that, that, that architecture. Um, through a variety of schemas. But, but that leads me to say that these acts of imagination to link to the aspirations you're saying are how we potentiate our human life and our future well-being. Right, right. how, do, how do we potentiate, not overcome the architecture, but how do we design um, for the future we, we, um, we hope for? Uh, we may not even imagine it yet, but we hope for. Um, and how? And because it requires prospective planning, it's not likely to happen through Brownian motion and chance. How, how do we set that in motion more effectively? Now, your and my hope has been that by yeah, bringing yeah. architecture and public health together, that would be a first step. And hopefully, with all of you, we might imagine it. But, but there are guiding principles. So we've imagined s several, actually building on some of Carlos's work when he and his colleagues at the World Health Organization said we needed to design for co-benefits, bringing health and sustainability together. Um, we've imagined adding 
maybe demanding tri benefits of anticipatorily designing for uh, health sustainability and to ensure well-being for old and young, for the two most vulnerable ends of the age spectrum, with the theory that, that those designs would be good for everybody. But today we've heard many additional benefits we need to design for. Uh, joy, equity, access, social capital, cohesion, uh, essential principles that might guide our acts of imagination. So what would you do with that, Mark? Uh, well, st starting with this first thing, which of course I love about the, 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 the much older and the much younger. Uh, I mean, it's a, it is al alarmingly accurate to say, particularly in the United States, that cities are, if you said yourself, I, if you're from Mars and I, you wanted to figure out how cities, why cities are organized the way they're organized, if you had a hypothesis which said they're organized to maximize efficiencies of work, that they're really set up to support work, um, you can explain 99.99% of what you will see. Which means, of course, that, that therefore cities are really designed for the working years of somebody's life, um, which, interestingly enough, are the times in which actually architecture is relatively irrelevant. You know, as I learned from you, I mean, you, you are likely to die as an old person because of a very small change of temperature in the hospital rather than any particular thing you may be suffering from in that hospital. And of course, as a very young baby, you need a prosthetic, you need architecture for survival. So the, so the point of maximum work coincides with the minimum need for architecture. So maximum resilience of the, bi of the biological instrument so actually, cities are in, in completely or organized in reverse. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and maybe that could go on for a while, but not when people are living to 100, mm -hmm. when the social contract and the architectural contract will change. And then, of course, I totally agree with you that the synergies between the, the, the very young and the very old will actually become a kind of vital resource mm -hmm. that will be maximized by people who are organizing cities. So clearly, if I can link generations together, I, ca I can I continue the sort of city effect, which is this sort of exponential growth. But I, I think if, if, if you go, if you kind of re-engineer an architecture school and say, come on, from the beginning, really what you've been thinking about is health, I think one of the ways to, 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 to address this issue is to reverse engineer the con conversation. So for example, in terms of the conference today, is public health and environment. Well, the end is a little bit unhealthy, I would say, because it, it, it assumes that there is the organism, again, and the environment. Mm -hmm. So it's based on a kind of a model of the, uh, of the organism as a kind of a victim of its uh, uh, surroundings. But if you, if you think of health as environment, right, if you say, uh, uh, and therefore public health is a particular kind of environment, it, that, that means it's already an architecture. So. The question is not like, how can the School of Public Health hang out with some architects and add architecture into the mix? But what is the architectural ambition of the core value of public health? Like what kind of sp you know, space is defined? Now if you look at aging, that's a very easy, easy way to see it. That's, that that's an expansion of the environment in time. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, and if you just think of every dimension of public health as a, as a spatial, condition, as an environmental condition, I think it's much more uh, 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 provocative. And, and, and in as much as architecture is also, and actually probably mainly, more like an art form, like if you know what you want, you don't ask an architect. <laughs> You're crazy to ask an architect if you know what you want. You ask an architect when you don't know what you want, mm -hmm. and a big part of architecture is to try to come up with some idea of what it is that you might be wanting. You don't give the client what the client asked for, but something that in retro the client wishes that they had asked for and later on pretends that they did, <laughs> right? Um, but the, re but the, reason, the, the reason you call an architect is architects are very good at imagining, uh, very good uh, at synthesizing incompatible forms of information. So if the task is impossible, call an architect. And the architect will just sort of jump in there, either with brilliance or naivety, and just say, okay, 
I see this kind of organization, they don't solve your problem. They actually allow the problem to continue. They allow the ecosystem to keep, to, to keep going. So mainly the role of the architect, like the role of the artist, is actually to reveal your own environment. So you wouldn't turn to architects and say, make us more healthy environments. You would say, could you use your capacity to expose environments, to let people see the world they live in, in such a way that they may, may change their dreams? Right? So the basic idea of architecture is that you produce a hesitation in daily life in which you see your world for the first time, and for the first time you hesitate, and maybe you think differently, maybe therefore you dream differently, and if we all dream differently together, we will live in a different place. So architecture is understood to be uh, sort of a, a kind of a virus. This is why, by the way, uh, uh, architects, there is no such thing as an architect who says, no, this is not a commission for me. I mean, I, if one of the gods were to say to any architect, you know, I've kind of getting bored with Earth, and I really, th I needs to be redone. Um, most architects will say, I'm just amazed that you came to me, and then start immediately on the project. But they would do so with the same um, mentality as if they were doing a doorknob. Because the thought is, if a doorknob is done right, then it changes the way you think about your world, and if you change the way you think about the world, it changes how you behave when you meet someone else. So architects imagine their work to be to be a sort of uh, virally positive. I've, I ha actually have never met an architect who thought that the effects of their work were unhealthy. Right? So, so I can't resist saying that um, there, one of the pleasures of this journey that we've been on is to find the commonalities between architecture and public health. And I, I mentioned two. One, one, because they, one is an art and one is a science. And yet, um, for 30 years, I've, I've talked about the science that we do as um, the, uh, the closest analog I can find is how Michelangelo describes sculpting, which is that uh, it was merely the art of chipping away the marble to reveal the figure that's truly in the stone. And that's what the scientific process is also about, is trying to get as close as you can in, in approximating the truth of the situation. Um, so you're using terms very s close to my heart as you're describing this. But the other, th uh, the other thing I have, you have educated me on is the premise, wh which is that there are some things, uh, while the spark may come from someone's imagination, there are some things that are public goods that we can only accomplish together. And, um, and, and certainly that, as I said at the beginning, that's the definition of public health, that there are public goods that we can only accomplish through collective uh, inquiry and, and translation and action. And cities are of a scale where, where that's the only way to go about this. And so um, I wonder if we could pitch a few questions to the audience to imagine what the next stage of this act of imagination of creating the synergies sh between disciplines should be to find the images of, of, of cities of the future that we will all benefit from and that will potentiate our aspirations. Peter.
just a quick reaction. So, um, I mean, Hunter is, um was also in a way fascistic because um, in the end he had, he had a kind of pretty good idea what people should be doing with those bits of, so he kind of hung around and made sure they put, freely chose to put all their pieces where he wanted. So, <laughs> so, so, um, but I still agree with you. In other words, he's just not, in the end, he's not just a good, he's not a good model of the principle that you took from him. Uh, actually, a lot of people who have great principles don't, are not the best example of the principle that they produced. And, and, and they almost develop the principle while they're trying to understand you know, their own behavior. This gets, it gets back again to the b bad architect, good theorist model. A little bit what I mean by social media is, is that the only hesitation I'd have in your description, I, I, one wouldn't assume what would constitute material, what would constitute infrastructure, and what would constitute this shared goal. In other words, all those things would be up for rearrangement. And, and, I, and I hope it's clear, I, I'm not making an opposition between sort of artistic imagination and sort of scientific rigor. For me, for me, science is absolutely about art in the sense that science holds up a mirror to society and lets it see itself. So, so, so science is an incredibly sophisticated form of performance with images, data, and so on, trying to show people something that might change behavior. Uh, so in, in, in a certain sense, science is more romantic in its aspirations and its, and its techniques than, for example, a, a professional field like, like, like architecture. So, but, it, so, but imagination, let's say, in the face of, um, of a community that has the ability now to share materials, ideas, dreams, best practices, it seems to me, knowing what other people are doing in a similar situation in another place that's not the same as your, situ your situation but sort of got some relationship, this is incredibly important. So I, I think we have a new generation of expert emerging. Even science, science is itself now done effectively in a kind of multilateral, you know, a much more um, open source and dis distributed intelligence uh, mode. So let, let's say if you use this distributed intelligence as the paradigm, words like buildings, you know, don't, may not even come together. Uh, I say this because, again, I would insist, I give you a, a, a small example. Public space, which maybe has a relationship to public health, there is no such thing as public space. Like public space is a dream. It's a dream that there would be a place in which something called the public would um, you know, express, their, express themselves to each other. Anybody that's theorized that, typically men have, have, have romanticized a Greek agora or something, which was actually full of men of a certain class who were allowed to speak. So actually what people are nostalgic for was not in any way public, was not a space. So public space is a dream, it's a fantasy, it's a utopia. It's, it's, it's a, one of the utopias on which we organize our lives. We imagine there could and should be such a thing. Social media might be realizing some of this sort of old dream. Public health could be a shared utopian, therefore in a certain sense unrealistic, ambition for a kind of place uh, or a shape or, or, or a space of, of health. And I think if, if to the extent that scientists and, and politicians and artists and architects and so on could collaborate to produce a sort of tangible aspiration towards something like public health, maybe it should be multiple. Maybe the idea that there is public health, which is you know, everybody living longer, getting less asthma, being fit. I mean, maybe the idea of a sort of a singular healthy body is uh, a mistake. Maybe we could have multiple layered, public health could be understood as a, as, a gar as a garden full of all sorts of different ways of being healthy. And you could, I mean, I think this is the kind of model I think would be very good. If there's a sort of a, sorry for the long speech, but if there's a singular thing called public health, it might be felt by everybody to be unattainable. But if public health is this extraordinary kind of garden of incredibly interesting social potential, lots of people could feel like they could participate in the construction of this image. And the, and the amazing thing about images is they become real. I mean, if you're going to be killed by something, uh, either it's a car, 
uh, or it's an image. But actually, cars are images of freedom and movement and so on. I mean, we, so you, when people die, they die in the middle of an image, an image of their own right to be you know, moving at high speed. So if one constructs an image of public health that's really extraordinary in its complexity and so on, which is what I was hearing today, it's, it becomes, it can be realized. I mean, utopia is, uh, uh, they're real. Anyway, sorry. So, um, this goes along very much with uh, I, what I think of as the 21st century necessities of accomplishing public health, which is that it's a cross-sectoral, all sectors in enterprise as well as an act of aspiration, bringing right. science and art to the fore. And in that spirit, there are hands on the back. Um, yes, go ahead. You've got to stop this Dean Wigley thing. Okay. You know, I, I, I've made it very clear I hate that so much that I... Uh, I don't know who that person is. There, there are so many ways that things are viral, aren't they? Um, Lynn Friedman described the transformation of having these um, little birth centers as creating a whole viral epidemic of, of survival of, of mothers and childbirth. So lots of, and because it caught, right? That's what you told us. So even another dimension, perhaps, of viral. Uh, Mark, do you want to respond to that as well? Um, yeah, of course, I love all those um, situations where people try to eradicate illness by actually introducing another illness, right? Like giving the mosquito a problem so that the mosquito's ability to give us a problem is reduced. So I think, I think, I think, uh, um, at the very least, we have to acknowledge that the city is a viral phenomenon, all, all dimensions of it. So e even if you don't want to use viruses against viruses, what you are engaging with is a, is a viral phenomenon. Is that, was that song the, the happy, the happy the one? Happy, yeah. Oh yeah, the happy one. So it's kind of close to healthy, right? I mean... Um, joyful. 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 <laughs> um, no, but I think, I, think I think you're so right. I think you're so right. Yeah. Um, one in the b there were two hands in the back. I couldn't, yeah.
I think evidence is an artwork, as you could imagine. So I think evidence can play an enormous role, but but it's e evidence is really um, is the visualization. It's like let's say the visualization of data sets is a highly strategic and crucial art form, and the way that the data is being communicated that the, that could be the project that experts from different fields could concentrate on rather than, as it were, finding the right evidence, but actually finding the, you know, again, viral technique for, for positioning uh, that information. Uh, the cynical view, which, and therefore the one I have, um, I is that um, we always underestimate how the, the worst of humanity is, is, is often the s sort of seeds of um, of change, like war, 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 wartime is, is such a sort of technological boost. Um, in that spirit, you could say that um, the, f the fact that the children of the Chinese politicians are now getting sick is for the first time producing what seems to be a genuine attempt from Chinese leadership to address the disastrous health consequences of their city. In other words, it's, a it's actually warfare. It's actually your own family getting hurt that is producing for the first time and I think on all, almost all of the other all of the other ways in which we can complain about the way China has so faithfully imitated the American model and we play the holier than thou how dare you under, not understand that we that was such a bad thing that we were doing um, uh, None of the various ways in which we have tried to argue that, that, that that's a terrible situation have had any impact. But health, and maybe this is something I was learning from Linda, that the actual public health consequences that are, are not um, uh, related to your position in the, cl in the political system, in other words, you're just as vulnerable no matter where you are, the or organic full ecology health disaster that's going on is actually now leading to sort of certain changes. And it wouldn't surprise me that China uh, develops certain strategies that are more progressive in public health terms than here, and we have no, you know, nothing to be proud of uh, here. By here I mean, you know, across the river, because we all think New York is, is, is extraordinary. This means, uh, does this mean that people have to get even more obese before uh, something happens? My guess is yes. So I'll just um, also say that um, cynicism and, and necessity and optimism can collide. <laughs> and we ha I think we have all three. Um, this conversation today is an attempt to begin the creation of an imagination of the structures that we, the, the conversational structures we need for the future that you were just describing, where we can challenge each other, where, where we can offer each other knowledge and evidence uh, that can uh, guide to a better path. And I think we need to create many of those, at least intellectual structures and working structures so that form follows function, essentially, for our 21st century challenges. I'm getting the, the nod that we need to stop in, in two minutes. So, um, Carlos, may I give you the last word? Not the last one, but the first for the continuation of the dialogue. No, I, I think we, we struggle with this business that we do a lot with risks and with diseases because we know those, and we know how bad they are, and you know how dramatic it is the need to respond to those things. So I think we, we, we have that, um, response, which is a more medical response, like is we, ne we need to help the suffering, right? I mean, it's not that we're going to stand out in imagination and thinking, you know, l let's just re imagine a, a, a better world. And I think that sort of grounds us to perhaps to an extreme level. And so much so that we tend to focus on risk rather than the benefits or the, or the alternative solutions. So I think for me, it was very illuminating and I love uh, Natalie's uh, presentation and, and what you all been uh, talking about, you, what, what you're saying as well. Uh, also in terms of risk, we, we end up not covering so much child development and the development of human being and, and uh, the, the other aspects of health 
which are not very much there. We tend to focus on the disease because it's so dramatic, because it costs so much, because it hurts, because it kills. Um, so I think the uh, fortuitous uh, connection between architecture and the imagination and the, the different ways of solving problems that you're just uh, illustrating and just referring to, I think is exactly that uh, necessity to deal with both things. And I agree completely, we come to New York, if not to other cities, because of the uh, what it springs in, in, into our imagination. I mean, that's, that's what is so attractive. Um, and I think people look for that, it's, it's, et cetera. So as j just to say that in thinking the ways and the methods and how is it that we, we don't have only, um, we, we can test our hypothesis. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm now the scientist again. But we have to be able to know, are we getting any better? Uh, are our experiments uh, you know, le leading us to a place which doesn't lead us all in obesity and you know, in, in, in a situation that we want, don't want to be? Uh, I think the methodological issue there is how we capture what you're talking about that I do think is by and large uh, missing from a lot of what we do because we focus so much on the drama and on the, the tragedy. Um, so in a way is, is getting that other part of the um, Greek uh, thinking, you know, which is the, the thinking through the futures, the, the, and I think that the imaginative solutions that, that you, you were talking about are very important. So capturing that is probably the future we want. Yeah. And, you know, a sort of some architect should be, you know, organizing that rather than whoever is there as my colleagues for the UN. That's what I say. Uh, but um, on my side, thank you for, for, for that. And I think that space for methodological thinking or how do we capture that, um, the, the thinking, the creative, the imagination in the, in the future of societies, in addition to dealing with the, with yeah. the risk and with the tragedy, yeah. is, is what I think the... the yeah, I, 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 was, I also just wanted to do, I mean, I, from the very beginning of the day, I was learning from you something uh, that I, I thought was amazing and was repeated a little bit by some other speakers that there would be benefits beyond health. Mm -hmm. and, and, and in a way the expression first made me hesitate because in a way I guess we are trying to say health is everything uh, mm -hmm. and architecture of course always thinks it's everything. Um, but it does seem to me an incredibly interesting argument to make because if, if, if the primary, if the benefits of health are beyond health then of course it plays right into a kind of argument about the macroeconomic system. So if basically public health is another metaphor for a kind of a healthy economy um, and, a, and a sort of a system as it were, then it seems to me there's a very real, there's a ver very real political uh, advantage to trying to make that argument directly to people who, who deal with macroeconomic systems. And so f for example in this country one could imagine real estate developers playing a leadership role in, in, in questions like public health because simply in terms of the long-term financial cycles and so on, this will be a more intelligent, more efficient way to address questions of housing, da 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 da. So I think, I think this idea that, that, um, that, 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 it, that it extends, to that, that the principles in, at stake in public health ultimately are, it, it gets back to the liver. If, you, if, if, you, if the public health issue is, is addressed intelligently, the health of the whole system is stimulated by that. And the ability, as somebody said earlier in the day, the ability to then move resources to another place. Um, that seems to me an unbelievably strong uh, 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 argument. And, and then you have a new generation coming through universities that could really believe that argument and believe it very s strongly. Uh, the only, only hesitation I would have is something similar was happening of course with sustainability and the thought that if we were less stupid about the way we use energy, uh, that, that finally arrives in architecture in a set of cli stupid cliches and the word sustainable is no longer uh, uh, sustainable. So again I was thrilled today when the question of health was understood as a disease of energy right? Diseases of energy. So I just think there's a, there, is a, there are a powerful ways that, that we are learning from you uh, about the, the macro, macro view of public health. And a lot of what happened today was setting up synergies between all the different dimensions of public health. 
And then I think there's a, there is really a, an incredibly important shared task to sort of, as it were, launch this image uh, uh, forward. And, and you know, the, I mean, maybe it just gets like taken. And that this is really just to say thank you to you. So uh, this is so exciting. Um, there's, we can continue this after the formal close right now and hope that we all do. Um, thank you all for being the most vibrant and engaged group, um, not just the audience, but part of the creation that we're trying to, to get going here. And we look forward to its next steps from all of you th and with all together. Thank you. Thank you.